Soil School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Soil Network and the Mosaic Company. Welcome to Soil School. I'm Bernard Tobin. When I discuss soil with farmers these days, it doesn't take long for the conversation to come around to organic matter. Does it really matter? What percentage should I have in my soil? Um, how do I conserve organic matter? And, and how do I build it? Well, we're going to tackle some of those questions today with some help from my guest. Uh, she is a University of uh, Minnesota Soil Extension Specialist, Jody DeYoung Hughes. Jody, thanks uh, for stopping by. Great to have you back on Real Agriculture. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate being here. <laughs> Um, now, Jody, you shared um, your thoughts on organic matter at the recent Ontario CCA conference. Um, and I want to dig into some of that information you provided. And so, I guess when you, when people ask you about you know organic matter and does it really matter, um, I get you. You always start that conversation with resilience. Uh, yes, uh, you know we have a lot of different words out there and uh, sustainable and organic and stuff, but I really like the word resilient because what organic matter does is help our soil to rebound from drought or uh, excessive rain. It, it can recover quicker and help our crops grow better. Now, a, a discussion of organic matter, you, know, you, just, you just can't start. You've got to sort of set up some of the parameters. And a lot of that is, starts with what type of soil you're farming, whether you know, you, uh, you're on sand, uh, a silt loam, a clay loam. What's the difference and why is it important? Well, sands and clays intrinsically react differently and can only do so much. Um, You know, we have clays that can actually hold so much more water than silts and our sands, but they can hold it so tightly that it won't give it the very last drops to the crop. Whereas a silt will hold a little bit less, but will release more to crops. And then sands just can't hold the water. That's why we have irrigators on top of our sands. And they also don't form structure as strongly as our clays and clay loams. And um, they don't, you won't see as high of organic matter contents on our sands. And so you just can't expect to build a sand to look like a clay. Now, when you're talking about organic matter, you're comparing and contrasting. And sometimes it's just 2% organic matter versus 4%. And uh, I want to, I want you, you've got a great slide here um, on the impact and, and the, the difference of soil, uh, sorry, moisture availability and what it can mean for a corn crop. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, that organic matter can hold on to water and it also helps form structure so that when it rains, the water can get into the soil. When you have less organic matter, you have um, and more tillage, you have more fine particles on the top, the rain can infiltrate, and you get more of this crusting. So our organic matter is extremely valuable in water management. And so when you have 2% versus 4%, you know, what does that mean for you? Well, it means that your crop can go longer without moisture between the rainfalls, which is really important in July and August in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. So we have, um, you know, if you can go from, what is it, four days to eight days, uh, that can mean the world of difference. Um, There's some with the lower organic matters on sands need rain like almost every day to grow a corn crop when the corn crop is uh, at its most mature. Mm. When you talk about organic matter, you also talk about nutrient value, and you also talk about you know um, organic matter moving off the farm. Uh, can you put a, a value of you know what is one percent of organic matter valued at from a nutrient nutrient perspective? You know that that's blowing or running off the farm. Oh, it's it's so sad um, <laughs> when it's blowing off the farm. Uh, you know, organic matter one percent generally now. Maybe your listeners don't understand that organic matter is made from the things that die on top of it. So if you're in a tall grass prairie and you have that being made into organic matter versus under a forest or, um, you know, in your lawn, you're going to have kind of a different composition to your organic matter. So the numbers I'm giving you are a a general range. They're not, you know, exact. You'd have to do uh, your own testing for that. But you have about one in 1% organic matter, you have about 1,000 pounds of nitrogen. 
and that's slowly released over the years and that's um that's what we want you don't want thousand pounds all at once and <laughs> and and it's it's also based on like how happy your microbes are so if you have good moisture and good temperatures you'll get more mineralization of that nitrogen out to the crop and those are the years that you put down enough nitrogen to say for 200 bushel corn crop and you got 225 well where'd that come from your organic matter also, your organic matter has a lot of phosphorus and sulfur and some potassium in there. But the thing that it's most well known for is, uh, well, should be well known for, uh, I think we're starting to understand that more, is carbon. Carbon is invaluable. And about 55% of our organic matter is carbon. So when you lose uh, to, to wind and water, especially wind, it's taking the topsoil away, which is your most um, nutrient-rich, organic matter-rich, that dark black soil that we have here in Minnesota and the Midwest, and that's blowing away into the ditch or thousands of miles away, depending if it's the clay. Clay is microscopic. Uh, you can't see it with your naked eye. and It just blows away. And that can go thousands of miles. Whereas um, our sands and silts kind of bounce more along the surface, and that um, goes more to our ditches and our waterways, and we don't want that there either. And the, the bottom line for you, I mean, if you did some math for us, and we'll put it on the screen, and that is, you know, over a thousand acres, you can lose up to the value of $125,000. Yeah, and that's uh, for the nutrients that are lost. And then what would it cost to replace that? And around my area, it's about $25 a ton of good top uh, black topsoil. And, you know, if I went out to a farmer's place and said, hey, I'm just going to scrape off that top, you know, only a dime's width for an acre, which comes up to five tons. If you scrape off just a dime's width, that's five tons an acre that, that you're taking off. Uh, most farmers would probably kick me off their land pretty quickly. <laughs> now, you did um, some research um, or you presented some research on, you know, the impact of tillage and the need to reduce tillage, obviously. Um, um, just talk about this slide I'm going to put up here in a little bit. Uh, some amazing um, differences in the impact of mole board plowing, for example, versus, uh, you know, uh, some of the other types of tillage you have. Yes, Don Rakowski from ARS in uh, Morris, Minnesota, which is West Central Minnesota, is kind of our carbon guru. And what he, he has this, um, I don't know if you'll show the slide of Mr. Jim, which is a little plexiglass box that's placed over the soil. It's uh, not little, it's pretty large. And it will measure how much CO2 is being lost from that soil. And you can calculate that into organic matter. You know, what is being lost to the atmosphere instead of being built into organic matter in the soil. And what he found with moldboard plow is just one plowing for 19 days, they captured that CO2. They found that they were losing about 3,800 pounds of CO2 as our organic matter. And the thing about CO2 is you can't see it. It's a, you know, tasteless, uh, slight, uh, invisible gas. And But this machine measures it. Then with the different tillage machines, we're a lot less than moldboard plow. Then with no-till, you're about 700 and some. And that's kind of your natural uh, gas exchange with the atmosphere. And then what, uh, what you see is, well, how much carbon did we give to that crop that year? And it was only about 2,800 that the wheat gave. So the moldboard plow was pulling out 1,000 pounds more of that organic matter than what we were producing. The other thing is, is that moldboard plow needs another tillage pass in the spring, if not two, to get it back into shape. And that's not even counting that. And it's only counting for 19 days. What happens is you get this release of CO2 with the tillage. It just, you know, lets CO2 back out to the atmosphere. Then, because you warmed up the soil and you put residue into the soil, you're feeding the microbes. And then they release CO2. So you'll see this big burp, and then later on you'll see another burp where their numbers get up and going. So it's actually higher than what's on that graph. Another graph I wanted to look at as well, in that you talked about the impact of uh, you know tillage on water infiltration, and uh, you know how much water we can move through uh, through our soils, um, and you know for full tillage versus conservation tillage, something like strip till. Oh yes, uh, that one was done in Yuma, Colorado, 
And what I like about that one is they start a strip till in the fall. And then what you see is the next four years, how much water infiltration they can get into that soil. And the first year that they are doing strip till, they can get about two and a half to three inches of moisture into the soil um, that the traditional tillage could not. And that tillage there is a double disking. And disking is even tougher on the soil because a disc it shears the soil and tells it where to cut. And um, it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty destructive. And it, it really makes a fine particles on the surface. Again, when it rains, that crusts and you can't get the water into the soil. And they're showing about a half an inch an hour. And if you've kind of looked at our thunder boomers lately, they're dropping two to three inches in, well, sometimes 20 minutes, but, you know, up to an hour. And we got to be able to have a resilient soil that can absorb that water and get it into the soil where our plants can use it later. And so that's showing even the first year of strip till was doing that. And the main reason why is because you have standing stalks out in the field and they act like straws that wick that water into the soil very quickly. So, you know, that and you can do that with any tillage that leaves standing stalks out there will help wick that water into the soil. Final question for you, and it's a question I a lot of farmers will ask me, and we'll we'll talk about is, hey, you know, if I if I if I'm at two percent organic matter, how do I get to three? Or if I'm at three, how do I get to four? And I guess you know, just some thoughts from you on you know what's the commitment? How long does it take? How much does it, you know? How much do you need to get to that new level? Well, let's see. It took us about. 75 plus years to lose all that organic matter. Uh, when we had the tall grass prairies out here, we were around 10%. And now in Western Minnesota, we're at three to four. Some of our sands are lower. Like I said earlier, sands are gonna be lower, but they can actually build faster. If you start with a lower number, you can build it a lot faster. So you'll see research where they, they can build their uh, up a whole percent in maybe four or five years but if you look, they started at 0.7. It's like, oh, yuck. Um, I've never, I actually haven't seen a soil like that around here. Um, so when you're starting at a low level and you do the five um, philosophies for soil health, which is reducing your tillage or going to no-till and keeping the soil covered, adding livestock. But let's even just go to let's keep the soil covered as long as we can with either cover crops or, or residue to help build that soil. You can start building it and see changes in four, five, six years. But when you're at a clay that has 4% organic matter, it's going to take a long time to see that change over 10 years. Mm. So when somebody says, hey, I built up my organic matter from 1% to 5% in less than 10 years, shake your head. <laughs> they, they, they sampled a, a manure pile. Um, you can't do that. It's physically impossible if you know the chemistry and the, and the physical side and the biological side of the soil you cannot build it that fast well jody um some great insights today um always great to have you on uh, real agriculture thanks for stopping by we'll see you down the road thank you so much i appreciate it